book of Jude. And let's pick it up here in verse 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. They rebelled against God. Has he reserved in everlasting chains under darkness until the judgment of the great day? Now we also know that Satan had to fall before man was created, otherwise he would not show up in the Garden of Eden as Satan. So let's put this all together and let's see what happened? Let's go to Isaiah 14. Isaiah, nope, before we go there, let's go to 2 Corinthians 4. On the way back, let's stop there. Just happened to catch my eye. Let's understand that Satan is called the God of this world. Second Corinthians 4 and verse 3. And verse 4 tells us something very important. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid from them that are lost, in whom the God of this world. Now, Jesus called him the prince of this world, or the ruler of this world. He's also called in Ephesians, the second chapter, the prince of the power of the air, that spirit that now works within the children of disobedience, the God of this world. Now let's go to Isaiah 14, and we will put this all together, and we will see when Satan was cast down, when the war took place. Now when there is war, what happens? We saw in Jeremiah, the fourth chapter, when there's war, there's desolation and destruction, wasting. Now, Isaiah 14 and verse 12. How you are fallen from heaven. And isn't that what Jesus said? He saw Satan fall from heaven as lightning. Isaiah 14 and verse 12. How you are fallen, O Lucifer. And that means light bringer. He was to be the light bringer in God's plan, but he rebelled. Now, let me just mention something here that's important. In all of the secret religions of the philosophies, and also in masonry, they worship Lucifer as the light bringer. And Lucifer is declared unequivocally by Albert Pike as God. And they know what they're worshiping. That's why they have to have degrees to kind of let you in on the secret step by step. Because if they told a new initiate first out what they were doing, they would undoubtedly reject it. So you have to be brainwashed and brought along degree by degree by degree by degree. And when you get to be the 33rd degree, then they know that they are coming to the stream of light from Lucifer. Now, you will see that in this other paper that I gave you here. Let's continue here in Isaiah 14. How you are cut to the ground which did weaken the nations. For you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. Now this had to happen before the creation of man. Correct? I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Stars being angels above the angels of God. Get the advantage. I will also sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north, which is the mount of God, where the central government of God the Father and Jesus Christ is located, wherever that is in the universe. And I'm convinced that it's a whole lot closer to the earth than maybe we've imagined. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Now, where are clouds? Clouds are on the earth. What do you need to make clouds? You need water. Where's the only place that they've truly found any amount of water where there can be clouds in as far as our whole solar system is concerned? That's the earth. 
Now, they think that on Mars they can detect some things where there used to be water. Possible. So I just throw this in the mix as just a thought. Now, I'm going to ring the bell. Okay? The bell means that when you hear the bell, I'm going to give you an opinion. This is not dogma. This is speculation. It may or may not be changed in the future, and we will not rely upon it as absolute truth. But it makes you wonder, was there something on Mars before it was desolated in its present condition? Could be. So everyone is anxious to find out what is on Mars. Some people have said that there are some uh, temple-looking buildings or something on Mars, but that the United States government is holding back the information on that. I do not know. You can read that in the Inquirer Star, whichever you prefer. Okay? The question is, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Could that refer to literal stars? Yes. It could refer to angels. It could refer to both. And still have the same meaning. Okay, let's go on. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Now, that's an impossibility. Why? Well, we have a lesson from Paul. He said, shall the thing created, which it was, be greater than the Creator? No. Or shall the thing created say to the Creator, what are you making? And that's what he's doing with this statement by saying, I will be like the Most High. Therefore, you shall be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. And that's what's going to happen. Now, let's go back to Genesis, the first chapter. I can see we've made marvelous headway today. Okay. So what we are dealing with here is that after God created the heavens and the earth, in the beginning, something happened. And the word was, can be translated, became. Or its state of being became a desolation and a waste. So then what we are dealing with here, which is true, when we are looking at the earth in this condition, what does God do from that time forward? He renews the surface of the earth or recreates it. Doesn't he? Yes. When Christ returns, is he going to make a new heaven and a new earth? Yes, he is. Because all the stars of heaven are going to again be out of whack, are they not? And the earth is going to be all suffering from the wars and desolation and plagues, is it not? Yes. He's going to have to make a new heaven and new earth. How? By renewing the one that is here. It talks about that during the millennium, one of the things we will be doing is helping the people rebuild the waste places, which is the result of war. Now notice what else happened here. Continuing on in verse 2, and the earth being a desolation and a waste, and darkness being upon the face of the earth. Now, who is the prince of darkness? Satan the devil. So we have a dual meaning here. The light of God was not shining, number one, because Christ is the light, and that's what John the first chapter tells us. Satan is the prince of darkness, so we have symbolic the spiritual quality of the absence of light and darkness, and we have the literal darkness that it was dark. Maybe a thick darkness like it was in Egypt during the plagues. I do not know. And darkness being upon the face of the abyss. That means just the great deep. 
And the Spirit of God was hovering upon the face of the waters. Now, what is one way to get rid of radiation? You bury it in water, and you keep it there a long time. Now, we do not know how old the earth literally is. It could be many hundreds of millions of years old, as we reckon time, could even be billions of years old. And when you look at the geographical strata, what do you see? You see two floods. You see the killing of the warm-blooded animals in the flood of Noah, and you see the killing of the dinosaurs in a different strata and a different time, and that is always buried way down low with the so-called primitive rocks. Now, I will have to say that. Most of the things that they test, they don't test the literal thing. I found out this concerning the testing like... They go to Africa like Professor Leakey, and he's walking along the ground, and he sees part of a skull there. And he picks up this part of the skull, and he says, I wonder how old this is. Well, we'll take it in and do a scientific testing. So what they do, they go out and get some of the dirt, and they test the dirt for the age, not the skull. Now, if you understand the error in that, then you'll understand why most of these things are wrong with the carbon dating and even the argon carbon dating, though the dating is correct. The age of the soil may be totally different than the age of the bone which is found in the soil. Correct? Yes. Comment was made. We have we have um, Betty Gramlich, who used to live back there in Utah, where the dinosaur national park, uh, Marilyn Gramlich, Betty's her daughter. They're both here. Thank you. And I'm sure you've seen it, too. The, uh, the dinosaur bones right in the limestone. So when you test the stone, now let's look at it this way. You could take a calf. It died. You bury it. It's left there, say maybe 50 years. Someone comes back and does an archaeological excavation. They find these bones. They want to know how old the bones are. How long has it been there? Well, if they take the bones and test the bones, they will get an accurate test. But if they take the soil in which the calf was buried and test the soil, they're not going to get an accurate result because the soil was there long before the calf was buried in it. So that's why you find this great divergence. Now, how long it was that the angels were here in peace and harmony before sin, we don't know. But, God then had to renew the face of the earth, which is what he did here. So we have the spiritual darkness, we have the physical darkness, and now God is going to do something about it. Then said God, now we notice, we note, that by his word he commands. Now this is going to be so profound when we come to the creation of Adam and Eve. Because also this tells us our relationship and our destiny with God that God intended from the very beginning of the creation of Adam and Eve. So he commanded, let there be light, and light was. Light came into being. And God saw the light that it was good and divided between the light and between the darkness. And God called the light day, or assigned to it the name day, and to the darkness he called night. And evening and morning was day one. In the recreation of the earth for human existence. Because he already began with an earth that was in chaos and confusion, a wasteland and a desolation as a result of the war with Satan and his angels who fell and became demons. Now let's also notice something here that's important. 
when there was night and when there was day, what do we literally have? We have on half of the earth, it is night. Half of the earth, it is day, continuously at all times. But when it says the evening and the morning were day one, the evening ended the darkness where God was when he created and called into existence the light and separated it. And the evening ended the darkness. Just like when we go through, and that follows the pattern all the way through the Bible, when you come to evening or sunset, it ends that day. So this first evening ended the darkness because it was like just enough where God was so that it was evening and then morning was day one. Now let's go on, continuing here in verse 6. And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it be dividing between waters to waters. And God made the expanse, and he divided between the waters which were from under to the expanse and between the waters which were from above. And to the expanse, yes, uh, to the expanse which was above, and it was so. And God called the expanse heavens, and the evening and the morning was a second day. Now, some people think that the waters above had to do with perhaps an envelope of water or a some sort of water covering above the earth. I do not know whether that speculation has any validity or not. Some people have said, well, maybe there was a ring of water around the earth, and if there was a ring of water around the earth, it had to then end up being frozen, correct? Because once you get out of the temperature, it's going to freeze. Possible. This doesn't tell us exactly. Let's read it in the King James, verse 6. And God said, there, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. Now let's ask a question. Could this also refer to clouds? Are clouds full of water? Yes. And you know they are when it rains, right? Do they contain lots and lots and lots of water? Yes, they do. Especially when you get caught in some horrendous rain, you wonder when it's going to stop. So I would have to surmise from what is here that what he was doing was separating the waters from the oceans, which became the oceans, from the water which he wanted to have in the clouds. Now, whether there was a ring of water or a disk of frozen water around the earth, I do not know. It doesn't tell us. So we'll have to leave that in the realm of speculation. Evening and the morning were the second day. Now let's go to page 2 in the interlinear here. How are you doing? Reading right to left. And said God, let the waters be co collected from under the heavens into one place. And let the dry land be seen. Now, there is some evidence, geologically speaking, that there was one major continent on the earth at one time, and the seas all around it. Could be. This seems to lend some credence to that. And then they say that the earth was moved around and formed the continents as we have them now. Well, when you look at some of these continents, you can see that it makes sense. Some of them which are close by, you can see the difference. Like in the, the English Channel, you have the white cliffs of Dover on one side, and then you have the white cliffs, but not as much, on the other side. And you can tell that it was ripped apart and separated. However, 
I do not believe any of these things were gradual. I think they happened, bam, and it happened. Not a gradual thing. When you look at the mountains, especially those that go up like this, that didn't happen just a little, 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 little. It went bam, and it happened all at once. We can talk about that a little bit later. So there was the dry land. Uh, and to the collection of waters he called or named them seas, and saw, God saw, that it was good, and said, Let spring forth the earth, the seed, seeding herb grass, or grass or herbs, and trees of fruit making fruit, after its kind. Now we're beginning to get a lesson here as he's teaching us that it's after its kind. And I think that if we ever do get to the point of, of Noah's flood, I think it's telling us that the whole earth was corrupted. I think the animals were, the vegetables were, everything that man set his hand to do was corrupted, just like today. Everything is becoming hybrid and cross-genetics. Men had thought of and conceived quite a few things. If you have potatoes now that you cut open and they never turn black, you know that they have inserted a gene from a moth into that potato to keep it from turning black. They have done that. Yes, they've done that with genetics. I know some may not believe it. That's what they say. What else they can do, I don't know. Okay, so it's after its kind. Let's continue. And fruit and trees making fruit, which has its seed in it, after its kind. And God saw that it was good, and evening and morning a, a third day. Each one of these things in their sequence. I want you to understand that God is speaking or commanding all of these things into existence. Now, if you want to know the power of the Word of God, and if you want to know what God can do, here's part of it. He can command, and it exists. Now, let's continue on. And God said, let luminaries uh, be in the expanse of heavens to divide between day and night, and let them be for signs, for seasons, for days, and for years. This also lets us know that since there was light and day, and we're up to the third day, the question becomes, did God wait until the fourth day to create the moon and the sun? No. I think he set them back in the, a proper orbit that they needed to be because I believe, I'll ring the bell here again, okay, that they were knocked out of orbit when there was a war. The war between Satan and his demons and God and the angels. Now, what does God use? God uses the things that he has made. When you look at the moon, look at it very carefully. I think you will see that the majority of those things are not really volcanoes indeed, but craters from different uh, elements, rocks, or parts of the universe hitting it. Now, we have an unusual thing in our solar system. There is an asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Now, they know from what they've been able to see looking out into the heavens that these are really just chunks of junk rock. That's all they are. So God, in cleaning up the universe around us, just took all of those and put them into that orbit. Now, when stars fall from heaven, as we look at stars from heaven, is that going to be God sending a lot of those meteoroids back down to the earth, and when they hit our atmosphere, they're burning up? 
I do not know. Could very well be. But everywhere you look in our solar system, there are signs of chaos and confusion and war. In the Earth, though it's recreated for man's habitation, in Mars in particularly, and with the asteroid belt that is there. Now, some of the other planets, we would have to say we don't know if there was any habitation on them. I would have to doubt that there would be just looking at the way that they are now. Okay, let's go on. So then he set them for times, for seasons, for years, and uh, uh, and to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights, or luminaries, the illuminary greater for ruling the day, which then is the sun, and a smaller luminary for ruling the night, and the stars. And God put them in the expanse of heaven, so this shows a rearranging, to give light upon the earth and to rule the day and in the night, and to divide between the light and between the darkness, and God saw that it was good. Now, we also know, here's another reason why the holy days are to be kept. They are part of the creation of God based upon seasons. Okay, let's continue on here. God saw that it was good, and evening and morning were day four. And God said, let the water swarm with swarms of living things. Let's see what it says here, verse 20 in the King James. Yes. Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature, or swarming. That's a good way to, when you see some of these pictures of, of these schools of fish and so forth, swarming is a good word. And let fowl fly upon the earth and uh, over the expanse of the heavens. And God created the great sea monsters and all the living creatures or souls, all the souls of life that creep therein, with which uh, the waters swarmed after their kind. And every uh, fowl of wing or after every bird after its kind, and God saw that it was good, and God blessed them, saying, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the waters in the sea, and let the fowl multiply in the earth, and the evening and the morning were the fifth day. So again, God is commanding this creation by the word of his power. They are coming into existence. So therefore, let's understand something. When God told, for example, Moses, or anyone who is to write the scriptures, write this and put it in a book. It's going, you know, it has power to it. That's why the word of God is, is a living word. Now let's continue on chapter 1 and verse 24. And said God, let cause to go forth the earth, or from the earth, or to come up out of the earth, the soul of life after its kind, cattle, and the creeping things, or the creepers, and the beast of the earth after its kind. So you find a breakdown of the animals, as it were, as God would see it. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth, after its kind, and the cattle after its kind, and every creeping thing of the ground after its kind, and God saw that it was good. Again, God did it by speaking. Now notice, let's see what happened here. Now beginning with man. Then we'll go to chapter 2 because there are some very interesting things concerning man. And said God, let us, now this phrase, let us, 
Carl is writing in his in his paper the two Jehovah's of the Pentateuch. He's showing that grammatically and the syntax in the Hebrew, which means the way that it's written and the meaning behind the words, this is not God talking to angels. This is not God talking to a council in heaven. This is one of Elohim saying to the other of Elohim, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, it's interesting. He didn't say any of the cattle or any of the birds or any other thing was after the likeness of God. They were after their own created kind. Now, what is true concerning an image is very important. An image is made in the likeness of something that is other than the image. In other words, in this case, being God, God is the reality from which the image was patterned. After his image, after his likeness. Supreme creation, as far as the physical things are concerned. So much so supreme that he said, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the heavens and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping things that, that creeps upon the earth. And God created the man. Now notice, he didn't speak, did he? God created. In the other cases, God made and created by speaking. God created him in his image, in the image of God created him. Male and female created he them and blessed them. Now we'll, we'll finish all of chapter 1 here, then we'll get into chapter 2, and we will see that it was a special creation. And that's why it's recorded this way for us. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish, and over the sea, and over the fowls of the heavens, and over every beast uh, that creeps upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb seed seeding, which then is translated with the seed in itself, upon the face of all of the earth. Uh, and every tree in which is the uh, fruit of a tree, seed seeding, in other words, a seed in itself, uh, to you shall it be for food. Now, there are those who say that at this time they did not eat any meat. Uh, we don't know whether that is exactly so. He didn't say they couldn't eat of any of the animals here at this point, but he was describing what kind of of vegetation or fruits that they could eat, and that was with its seed within itself. Now today, we have oranges with no seeds. They can't quite get away with it because it pops up with a seed every once in a while. Uh, have they have they come to uh, uh, create or hybridize a seedless watermelon yet? Now, I'm sure in the scheme of things, God intended that there be certain things that man could do with plants and animals that are lawful and legal and proper. But I'm also sure that we're entering a time where there are a lot of things that human beings are doing to plants and animals which are not lawful. And I think we are reducing the seed reservoir, in particularly for wheat, because everyone is trying to have great abundance of wheat and rice and they are getting into the hybridized uh, production of those that I heard in one one show that I saw, that they are down to just maybe a dozen uh, uh, Genesis seeds of wheat. I don't know what it is for rice, but I do remember the, the wheat. Now, what they're doing in the potato, they're going to South America to try and get new genetic strains from the potatoes down there because we pretty well destroyed the genetic strains that we have up here. They're subject to all kinds of weakness and sickness and disease. So you can't outdo God's way. Now, when God made this, this was tremendous. This was great. 
Okay, let's continue on. And it shall be food uh, for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to all the fowl of the heaven, and to every creeper upon the earth, which has a soul, or the soul of them, which is a living soul, as it were, or the soul of life, have I given it. And it's true. We also have something here that's important. Hold your place here, and let's go to Isaiah 40, and let's understand something which is true, absolutely, profoundly true concerning all flesh, concerning human beings. Isaiah 40 and verse 6. Isaiah 40 and verse 6. And the voice said, Cry. And I said, What should I cry? All flesh is grass. And all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, because the Spirit of the Lord blows upon it. Surely this people is grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. And it is actually literally true. We are all grass. Even if you eat a steak, guess where that came from? Grass. Some kind of vegetation. You eat a chicken. Where did that come from? Grass. And worms. And a few other things. Okay. Comment was made, and people even smoke it. Yes, there are various kinds of grass. You have tobacco, and then you have marijuana. You have other things, and it's amazing what what people do. It it just sometimes all you can do is just shake your head as how great that our our creation is of our bodies and everything. Because what mankind does to itself and still survives is really just something else. Now let's finish here in verse. 31 of chapter 1, the last verse. And God saw all which he had made, and behold, it was good. Now, the Hebrew there for good means gracious or beautiful. So, in a sense, the whole creation of God was an act of grace by giving and providing all of these things rightly. It was exceeding good, and evening and morning was day six. Let's go here to the first verse of Chapter 2. And were finished the heavens and the earth and all their host, and finished God in the seventh day, or in the day seventh. Now I want you to look at the way that the Hebrew seventh is spelled there. Just look at the letters and compare that with sixth. You see, the only difference between the two is a middle letter. You see that? Letters are the same, but there is a different letter in the middle. God ended his work on the sixth day and rested the seventh. He didn't end his work on the seventh day. And what have we always had to say of that verse? That means he ended his work just before the seventh day began, which may or may not be exactly true. But if it is, God ended his work on the sixth day, what he's following his own laws, isn't he? Six days shall you labor and do all your work, correct? So I thought this was really a, a very uh, uh, meaningful understanding of what was going on here. God finished his work in the sixth day. Number six. Now notice the work which he had made. And he rested in both cases, in, within day seventh from all his work which he had made. So that helps clarify a lot, doesn't it? Now I know One day I was in busy doing some things, and all of a sudden the facts went, because I have it going 24 hours a day now. And here was this page faxed to me from Carl, noting these things. And here I had the interlinear and and hadn't had a chance to get in and study it yet. And here is a very profound, meaningful understanding concerning that, that that should be sixth day when God ended his work. 
So in other words, God himself also prepared for the Sabbath. Correct? Yeah. Now let's understand something. When God created the day and night, he started the cycle. Therefore, when it came to the seventh day, he made that day holy versus creating it holy. God created time and the days, and then he made the seventh day holy. Made is little less than created. Created is bringing it into its initial existence. Then made is maybe using the same thing, only doing something else with the same thing, which he did here in relationship to a day. Remember, Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man. He did not say created, said made, because time had already been created, but then God made this section of time holy, the seventh day. Well, we'll get into that a little more next time, because there is an awful lot here concerning the Sabbath, and then we will get into the relationship between God and man, and what God really intended is revealed in how he created man and woman.